Father, we thank you for the sure and steady anchor of your Son for our hearts. And Lord, that we have a firm foundation, a solid hope. Thank you for the work that he has accomplished. We praise you. We are so grateful for you. We are in awe of you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Please open your Bible to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. The first four verses of Colossians chapter 3. You can open up your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3. Maybe you've heard the saying that a person is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Yes, yes. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Or maybe the rebuke, maybe you've heard this or you've even said this, hey, come on, just get your head out of the clouds. And we know the idea here, there is undoubtedly times where someone is so fixated on things not in the moment that they neglect what is right before them. Yet the reality is nothing will aid our holiness and our ability to navigate this life now more than when our thinking and our pursuits are aligned with heaven. When by the Spirit and the work of God we live in faith for what will profit us in heaven at the expense of what will profit us on earth, we are doing well. The believer is to be tied to what is eternal, not what is temporal. We must set our minds, our thoughts, and our affections, our desires, our goals on what is heavenly, which is most connected to Christ. And that's the call of our passage this morning. That's what we're going to see in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 4 this morning, that we are to live for things above. Let's look at these verses together. Read with me Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Two realities drive the believer to heavenly pursuits. Two realities drive the believer to heavenly pursuits. There are two realities that flow out of the work of Christ in the gospel that are to drive the believer to eternal pursuits, to heavenly pursuits, to things pertaining to Jesus. There are two undeniable realities for the believer who has, as Paul says in chapter 1, been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to Christ's kingdom. There are two realities for one, as we saw in chapter 2, who has been made alive together with Christ that must drive, that must lead, that must motivate, push the believer towards pursuing the things that are above. The first reality is this. The believer's resurrection with Christ. This reality, the believer's resurrection with Christ, is to drive the believer to heavenly pursuits. The believer's resurrection with Christ. Number one, this must drive the believer to heavenly pursuits. Look again at verse one. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Paul begins chapter 3 with the word, therefore. Do you see that? It's the first word in the verse. What Paul is referencing here is that he's just made the argument and protection of the Colossians from false teachings. That since they have received Christ, walk in him, remembering his work, that they have been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, that they were buried with Christ and were raised up with him through faith in the working of God, that they were made alive together with him, having been forgiven all of their transgressions. 
Paul's emphasized in chapter 2, don't be persuaded by, don't give in to false teaching that would look to old religious activities and spiritual experiences or ascetic practices to accomplish what has already been accomplished in Christ. That's what we saw last week. Christ has accomplished and provided what is of value against fleshly indulgence, where these other practices are, as he says in the last verse of chapter 2, no value against fleshly indulgence. Then the beginning of chapter 3, we see this word, therefore, and then he says his next point. In light of these things, that Christ is all sufficient, that Christ has done the work, that we must be guarded against these worldly, earthly thinking and practices, therefore, if, And in our context, it's assumed true, a true reality. So if, or here it's understood since, you have been raised up with Christ, and that's the driving reality that fuels the instruction and calls for the instruction to keep seeking the things above. And that's the call, to keep seeking the things above. Your resurrection believer with Christ calls for heavenly pursuits. Because you have been raised up, since you have been raised up, if this is true about you, and if you're a Christian, it is, that you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. The believer's resurrection with Christ must drive the believer to pursue things above. Paul says, you have been raised You have been raised. And that is, it is a definite act. It has been accomplished. And God is the active agent in this raising. So the believer who has been raised up with Christ has been done so not in their own doing. God has accomplished this. And if you are a Christian, you have been raised from spiritual death to life with Christ. And there is such a union between the believer and Christ that you, at the moment of salvation, you enter into Christ's death and resurrection. When Jesus rose from the grave, he demonstrated power over death, power over sin. He demonstrated supremacy over all things as he defeated death. If you remember from chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus is called the firstborn among the dead, or preeminent one, or supreme one over death. And in his resurrection, we have been raised up with him. The believer is no longer dead in their sins. They are no longer at enmity with God. They are no longer slaves to sin. They are no longer under condemnation. The believer is raised up with Christ and possesses eternal life in him. They are citizens of Christ's kingdom. They can honor God in their lives. They can glorify God. Sin is no longer our master, but Christ is our Lord. Amen indeed. The believer at the moment of salvation is raised up with Christ, and in so being what Christ accomplished when he rose from the grave, his complete triumph over sin and death, those positional realities are true for each believer in Christ. And just ponder that for a moment. Ponder the implications of the true reality that if you are in Christ, you have been raised up with him. Being raised up with Christ means the victory Jesus Christ himself experienced in his resurrection. You have have now been given that victory also. And it is important to note you have been raised up with Christ. This is crucially important for our own hearts. It's not being raised up by what you've done, by what you've accomplished It's not that you got your life in order and now have been granted worthy to be raised up. It's not that your own righteousness has granted to you a raising up. You have been raised up for one reason, and it is because you are now associated with, you have a union with Jesus Christ. Christ accomplished everything to give you this positional victory, and you are blessed to receive the eternal benefits of it. 
I have many siblings. For a while, nine years, I was the youngest child in our home. And I don't know if you've ever said this to your children or had your parents say this to you, but you finish dinner and the encouragement is when the kitchen is cleaned, then you can have dessert. As the youngest child, you come up with amazing strategies to capitalize on the hard work of your older siblings. I found one strategy that I thought was effective where I would run to the restroom and sit in the bathroom until they finished cleaning the kitchen, periodically calling out, are you done cleaning the kitchen yet? So that I knew if it was safe to come out. Despite my most stealth efforts, I was quickly found out it didn't work. But like a youngest child who does absolutely nothing to help with cleaning the kitchen and yet reaps all the benefits of their older siblings doing it as they get to enjoy dessert, it's a lame illustration, but you get the point. Christ did everything. We did nothing. And we reap eternal benefit of Christ's resurrection that we are brought into. Isn't that astounding? Isn't that truly amazing? Isn't that freeing? The call, thank you. <laughs> the NG of lesson is over, okay? Just be quiet. <laughs> Just... It is amazing. It is truly amazing what God has done for us and the burden of having to somehow meet Christ's standard of righteousness that we could never attain on our own. God's standard of righteousness has been gifted to us in Christ, so we are viewed with his righteousness. Of course we'd want to seek things pertaining to him. Why would we not, in light of this, this uncomparable gift, uncomparable gift that we've been given in him? And so Paul says, if or since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. In verse 2, he's going to say a very similar statement and set your mind on the things above, which is essentially a restatement, but each of these holds a nuance that we'll unpack. So first in verse 1, he says, do you see that there? Keep seeking the things above. Your resurrected life with Christ calls for you to keep seeking the things above. And Paul says, keep seeking. To keep seeking emphasizes that this action is to be continuous. It's to be constant. This is to be the habit of the believer's life. And to seek is to strive after. It's what we aim at. It's our goal or our target. This is devotion towards an objective that you diligently strive for. The trajectory of our life is aimed intentionally and actively, even urgently, at this endeavor, which is the things above. This is to be the target of the Christian's life, seek the things above. So what are these things above that Paul has in mind here that the Christian is to keep seeking? Well, the things above refer to the heavenly realms and its realities. It is the place of God's abode. Paul has spoken already about the hope for the believer laid up in heaven in chapter 1, verse 5. And here he calls the believer to keep seeking things above, and he qualifies where he is referencing, what he is referencing by saying where Christ is. And Paul draws, draws the line between Christ and our heavenly pursuit, demonstrating that our pursuit of the things above is a Christ-centered pursuit. Our target is not simply a spiritual location or place, but it is realized in a person, in Jesus. We seek the things above, we are seeking Christ, and this is in contrast to the false teachings that were advocating legalistic, mystical, or ascetic pursuits that don't aid anything towards fleshly indulgences, but yet in Christ, as we've seen, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and in Christ, because of his work, a pursuit of him, of the things above, the heavenly, true, spiritual things, those things do have value, and in fact have an internal 
an eternal significance that will be enjoyed and realized upon Christ's return, as we'll see in a moment in verse 4. We seek the things above, heavenly things, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And Christ being seated next to the Father is a place of authority and intimacy. Christ has rendered all other authority powerless, and he intercedes on behalf of those who are his. And as those who have been rescued by God through Christ, as we have been rescued By God, through Christ, we are to seek things pertaining to Christ. And though we are not physically with Jesus now, we share a union with Christ that must drive us to have the aim of our life be urgently for the things that pertain to him, that pertain to eternity, that are things above. We are to long for our king we are not now with, We await his kingdom yet to come, and we wait for rewards that we will realize when revealed with Christ in glory. And yet until that day, we keep seeking the things above. And this is really faith. This is what it means to walk by faith, to live by faith. And this reality of who Christ is and what he has accomplished both enables and is fuel for the very purpose and pursuit of our life that it would be not for what is seen physically, but for the world that is unseen, that we will one day realize it is for heaven, namely it is for Christ himself. And if we have been raised up with Christ, if these realities of Christ's righteousness being imparted to us, why would we ever settle for anything else? Why would we return to pursuits that are aligned with spiritual death? Why would we return to pursuits that are pertaining to fleshly things, to sinful things, to inconsequential things? No, rather we keep seeking the things above. And once again, the order of this is masterful and so important. It's so freeing. It's not seek the things above and hope you can someday attain it. No, since God has done this work, raising you up with Christ, keep seeking what is in accordance, what is in accordance with the new life that you have been granted in him. God is the active agent Christ accomplished it, you received it, and now we are called to live in accordance to this miraculous work that God does in saving sinners. What a joy and privilege it is to seek and keep seeking things pertaining to above. That is a privilege. That's not a burden for us that the Lord lays on us. That is a gift from above that we would be able to concern ourselves with that which bears weight into eternity. Have you experienced this? Have you experienced salvation? Have you been raised up with Christ? Or are you trying to raise yourself up? Are you trying to appease God's expectations in your own strength strength on your own doing? Have you submitted to your your Savior, to Christ in faith? I would plead with you to do so. And if you have not, but you are being stirred in that direction, I would ask you to speak with me, speak with any one of the pastors or whomever brought you. We would love to talk with you about what a life submitted to Christ is all about. What are the pursuits of your life? If you were to characterize the pursuits, the things that are on your, on your heart and your mind that you seek after, that you go after in life, what would, what would characterize those things about you? This is a good check for us. One of the things that I love about our church is how much you do seek things pertaining to Christ's glory, that you 
love fellowship, that you love God's word, that you pursue holiness diligently. And yet as we're faced with a passage like this, we have to bring our hearts before God's word and do some personal inventory. Where are the holes? While there is much to rejoice in God's work in you in ways that you consistently pursue what is above, where are the holes? Where have earthly, old, gross pursuits crept into your life that you have been content to not address? Let's address those together. Two realities drive the believer to heavenly pursuits. The first reality is, number one, the believer's resurrection with Christ. And the second reality is very similar, but comes at it from the other direction. And that's number two, the believer's severance from the world. Severance from the world. Look at verse two. Paul says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. In verse 1, it was if you have been raised up with Christ, or since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. And here it is, set your mind on the things above for or because you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul is, again, giving a very similar command with, as I mentioned before, a slight nuance. Before it was keep seeking, which has to do with the external action, and here it is set your mind on the things above. It has to do with the realm of the mind. This is to think. It's to have an attitude or to form an opinion. This is the internal intent of one's heart. And in this instruction, it's a restatement of what Paul says before, but it's, it's taking things to another level. Before, Paul's emphasis was on the pursuits, but now he's also addressing your thoughts. To set your mind is to focus your efforts. It's not only now your pursuits, but your posture. One commentator says, you are to not only seek heaven, but you are to think heaven. The believer is to have their mind set on heavenly things. Organize your life around heavenly goals, not earthly ones. The driving principles and pursuits of your life as a believer should be spiritual and eternal in nature. And look at the second half of verse 2. This is in contrast to the things that are on earth. Do you see that there? Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. And these are polar opposites. You can't set your mind on things of the earth and seek things above. There is a direct contrast here. Either you are setting your mind on things above or things of the earth. And the things that are on the earth are the things having to do with fleshly indulgences that Paul referenced at the end of chapter 2. The things of the earth are temporal, worldly, not focused on God, not seeking his glory, but rather simply living for self now. And the point here is not to separate your proximity from the world. We are not here called to go live on a mountain somewhere, away from everyone and everything. We are in the world, but we are in this called to not be of the world, not be driven by that which drives the world. We function within this world as those who are citizens of another realm, of another world, and our thoughts and pursuits and motivations and treasures are not found in what this world possesses, but are found in who Christ is. Some have thought to fixate your heart and your mind on heaven is to hinder your usefulness in this life now, and nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, Paul in the rest of this chapter is going to spell out very specifically what one who is setting their mind on things above does and pursues and thinks and how they act. In fact, what does this heavenly mindset and pursuit look like? Well, it looks like fighting sin. It looks like dying to all the things that you lived for apart from Christ where you now put off sin and you put on all these attributes that 
Paul is going to set forth that looks like selfless love and humility. Desiring holiness rather than saving face, it looks like bearing with each other eagerly, forgiving quickly, loving thoroughly. It's living dominated by peace and not fear. It's being unified in the church, with the church, connected to other believers, centered around God's word with constant thankfulness in all things. It reaches every relationship. It touches marriages. It reaches parent and child relationships. Slave and master relationships. Everything is affected by one who is pursuing things above. All of your life's aims and goals and pursuits and responses are impacted if you are setting your mind on things above and if you keep seeking things above. There is a dramatic change in the focus of our lives, a change in the perspective of our lives. You set, you set your mind on things above and not on things that are on the earth. And, and this does not mean simply to not dwell on the overtly atrocious, sinful acts or worldly pursuits that come to mind when we think about worldliness. Those things are undoubtedly included in this, but anything, even seemingly neutral things, if they are not done for Christ, if not done for a realm beyond this one, for heavenly, eternal purposes, they are not commendable. If your whole life was committed to bettering things on this earth, but not done as one raised with Christ for the purpose of glorifying God, it is of no eternal value. It gains us nothing in eternity. The call for the Christian is to pursue things above, heavenly things, things pertaining to Christ. And for the one not raised up with Christ, anything accomplished in this life, for this life, apart from Christ, bears no way into eternity except increased judgment and condemnation because everything should be done for Christ. So if we are ever at any moment in unbelief doing things not for Christ, we are sinning against a holy God. Paul recalls this in his own life in Philippians chapter 3, that everything that was gained to him prior to knowing Christ, every accolade, every earthly or worldly pursuit or accomplishment or human virtue now in Christ is rubbish compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus his Lord. To forsake worldly thinking and worldly pursuits is the driving force of your life and to pursue Christ and dwell on heavenly things is always what is best. If you will but do that, you will lack nothing that is good and of value in eternity before God. Life might be hard. In fact, it is hard. Trials will come, persecution will be experienced, troubles and anguish will increase in this life, but the difficulty of those things are nothing. As severe as they feel and are in a moment, they are nothing compared to the glory that is in store for the believer. And the unmeasurable blessing at salvation of being raised up with Christ and having union with him. Before Paul appealed to the reality that as a believer you are raised up with Christ, so seek the things above. Here in verse 3, Paul appeals to the fact that you have died. This is your severance from the world. Paul has already stated this reality in chapter 220, 
saying you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world. And here he says, you have died, and that death took place in union with Christ. You were once bound to, enslaved by a life centered around the world, but through Christ's saving work, that old way of life is dead. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, you were crucified with Christ. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you, and now this life you live in the body You live not as one that is concerned and consumed with fleshly things, but a faith-filled life in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. And then the second half of verse 3, Paul contrasts his statement that you have died, and Paul makes one of the most profound and wonderful statements. See, See, your death to earthly pursuits isn't the end. It actually is the entrance into what is truly marvelous. Paul says, look at verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is the only place in Scripture where a believer's life is stated to be hidden with Christ. Yet, it is not unclear what Paul is addressing here To be hidden, hidden is to be tucked away or to be kept from being seen. And what Paul is saying here is that the believer's purpose, the goal, is something that is not realized yet or revealed in this lifetime to the world. The world in which we live can't make sense of the believer's life. Not all of what will be revealed has been revealed yet. For your life to be hidden with Christ and God means the world, those in the world, don't get it. They don't understand why the Christian would live the way we live, why we would have peace and turmoil, why we would rejoice in trials, why we would die to self for others, why we would remain under hardship, why we would join together with others and sing songs and rejoice in Jesus' blood and his work and our sins being washed away, why we would listen to sermons long ones, some longer than others. Why why would we confess sins, give resources generously, pray for others diligently? Why would we study our Bibles? The reasons of how we live cannot be seen by the world. It simply does not make sense. Our life, who we are, what we are about is hidden in Christ. And if the world says they get it, they get why the things we do, they get why we are concerned with what we are concerned with, they get why we think about the things that we think and why we seek after the things that we seek for, it is not true. They've imposed their own thoughts upon their understanding. Our life, our preoccupation of seeking and thinking of that which is above is hidden with Christ. It is hidden with Christ in God. The world did not get Christ. The world does not, apart from a divine act of salvation, and cannot get it. We are hidden with Christ in God. Yet while they are not seen now, while, while, they are not, while they are hidden now, they will not be hidden forever. And Paul clarifies this. He brings light to what he's saying in verse 4. Look at verse 4 of chapter 3. Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. People live their whole lives living for this world to maybe or maybe not get some of the things that they think this world offers. If there is no more sure reality of what awaits one who is hidden with Christ, and there is no more wonderful result that could come than what awaits the believer. And we have to note what Paul says in verse 3, our life is hidden with Christ, and then he makes another beautiful, staggering statement that he says, he says, Christ who is our life. Christ is our life. What does it communicate outwardly when you seek relentlessly the things above and set perpetually your mind on the things above? It demonstrates the wonderful reality that Christ is your life. 
Everything about who you are is to be bound up in him. For the believer, Christ is our life, and though the world does not see him as they should now, when Christ is revealed, that is, when Christ returns and destroys all of his enemies, all opposition extinguished as he establishes his throne on the earth, when all things come under the authority and the rule of Jesus perfectly on this earth, when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, what is hidden now will be hidden no longer. What the believer confesses and lives for now will be acknowledged then as Jesus is seen and proclaimed universally as Lord of all. Many on that day will confess these things to their shame. We confess it now to our joy and for our future glory when Jesus is revealed, when everything about Christ and the world does not see now is seen and hidden no longer about the greatness and glory of God in his son, Jesus Christ. We too, who are raised up with Christ, who have been raised up with him, will also be revealed with him in glory. There is no more sure reality than this. It is a done deal. You will on that day be sinless forever, reflecting the glory of Christ himself as you will be perfect for all eternity, enjoying God for all of eternity. And on that day, on that day, all of the striving for holiness, all of the sleep lost to get up early and read your Bible, all of the sorrow felt over sin and its effects, all of the trials endured in faith, all of the sacrifices made for Christ and for his people, all of the struggles experienced will be but a moment, not even to be compared to this eternal glory that you will attain and the purpose for those temporal struggles will be realized as you step into eternity. Your hope in heaven you possess now will be proven to not be in vain and all that is hidden will be exposed. It will be incomparable and eternal and wonderful. Do you ever feel faint-hearted in your pursuit of Christ? Do you ever feel weary in your pursuit of the things above? Maybe even this morning you came here to church because you knew it was the right thing to do, but maybe you're, maybe even you're watching from home and you just feel beat up. You feel weary, you feel downcast, disheartened, weak, Beloved, remind yourself of your union with Christ. Remind yourself that you have been raised up with him. Set your pursuits and your affections on what you know from God's word to be pleasing to him and press on. Press on. Because though the weight of this moment feels intense, the reality of that day will put all things in perspective and there will never be a moment in eternity where you regret forsaking things below to pursue what is above. Take heart. Confess sin. Join closely with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Share your disheartened state. Confess it. And let's help each other. Press on. When Christ is revealed, we too will be revealed with him glory. We long for that day. We anticipate that day. We live for that day. And we recognize that all of this is because of Jesus. It's all because of what he has accomplished. He is our glory. He is our hope. He is our life. He is our king. And he will be to the glory of God forevermore. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this truth. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for what he has accomplished in the gospel. Thank you that all of our transgressions, every single one, have been forgiven. Our debt canceled out. And that our, our old life is dead. And that we have been raised up with Christ. Thank you so much, God, not only for these positional truths of what you have done and accomplished to reconcile us to yourself, but thank you also for your strength and your power and your mercies and your grace to help us live in light of these things. And thank you, Lord, for the hope of eternity, the hope of heaven. Give us faith to believe what is true, that that will be attained one day, and that when Christ is revealed, we will be revealed with him also in a wonderful, sinless state in glory. Lord, we long for that day, but until that day, I pray that we would be consumed in our, in our seeking and in our thinking with that which pertains to you. With that, with those things that bear way into eternity for your glory. Thank you for the immense privilege that it is to be your child. We love you. We want to rejoice in you now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.